I feel intuitively that my identity is depth. Like it's 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 of depth itself. Like it is a rather than a thing, it is a dimension of experience. It's like you know when we are present, when we after like when we meditate or right after we do inner work practice, there is a sense that. There's a sense of like a kind of a saturation of one's experience, like one's impressions feel saturated. They feel pregnant with meaning. Welcome to another episode of What It's Like to Be You. This is a show where I interview people about what it's like to be their Enneagram type. And I'm Josh Levine, your host. I am super excited about today's conversation with my friend, John Luckovich, who is a type four. I have a massive man crush on John Lukovic. I think he is brilliant and he has been a major influence on me and the way that I think about the Enneagram and has helped me clarify a lot of really powerful insights about myself and the Enneagram in general. I think probably in my generation, John has had the most actual professional immersion in the Enneagram field of anybody that I know, certainly. Um, he worked for Russ Hudson, who wrote the book or co-wrote the book, The Wisdom of the Enneagram with Don Riso. Um, and he has also written his own book recently, which came out called The Instinctual Drives in the Enneagram and has made a huge, in my opinion, contribution to the Enneagram field, really clarifying what it means when we talk about the instincts and why we talk about them with the Enneagram and inner work at all. John is just so, so clear in my experience, talking about his own inner perspective and what it's like to be him and what it's like to be each of the Enneagram types. He has that four quality of just like really being willing to get into the muck of, of, the, of the human inner world. And not just the muck of it, but to bring an incredible amount of clarity to what's really going on inside him and inside all of us. So please welcome my friend, John. Welcome everyone to another interview. I am very delighted to be joined by my friend, John Luckovich today. John is leads with Enneagram 4. He's also an Enneagram teacher, author of the book, The Instinctual Drives in the Enneagram, which is really, really amazing. And I highly recommend you check it out. He also is a co-host on the Big Hormone Enneagram podcast and an artist and um, and actually, you can see some of his art behind him there on the walls. And he also leads trips into Egypt. And we might actually get into a little bit of that, too, in this conversation. So first of all, hi, thanks for joining. Thank you, Josh, for having me. <laughs> You're welcome. First of all, I'm curious, what's it like to be um, introduced like that in a context like this on an interview? <laughs> That's a good and interesting question. Uh... There's a, it, you know, it always feels like uncomfortable. Uh, it's always, you know, because like the things that you're having, like you're introducing for me uh, are both um, to give people some genuine context, but also because like I need to keep putting myself out there to keep uh, like keeping this Enneagram thing going. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it feels just sort of like silly. Like it feels like, like a cartoon character. Right. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Okay. So maybe I'll just start actually with the question I've started with everyone so far is, can you share a little bit of your, your Enneagram origin story? How I learned the Enneagram? Yeah. Um, so I was, uh, when I was in high school, uh, I was on a camping trip. Uh, with like a certain class and I had two friends uh, Mary Cloud and Colleen Conboy and we just started to kind of like get to know each other and basically just my friend Mary came out with John you're a four and uh, asked her what the fuck was that and she explained what a four was and uh, it was pretty shocking to me because part of my experience and part of what you know about uh, the four description is they they feel unique. They feel like completely separate from other people and other the world. Like it's it's like this is not my place. Like like what am I doing here? This is not. It's like a big no. So to have something um, 
really to a T describe me uh, was pretty fascinating and shocking and kind of sickening. And so, um, you know, I just got obsessed with it from there. Uh, Mary's Mary's dad uh, had been friends with Don Riso in college, so she'd grown up with the Enneagram. And so, uh, you know, it was like it wasn't just somebody who had read a book and then was just saying what they saw in a book. It was like she'd lived with it her whole life. And um, so it was a very interesting. Uh, it, it was just interesting because she was some talking with somebody with with a lot of impressions about the Enneagram. So, yeah, so then I, I got really obsessed with just trying to understand it. And then um, very, very quickly, I got interested in the Gurdjieff stuff. And right. um, that really enhanced my interest in the Enneagram personality, actually. So let's see, where did it go from here? There's so many directions we could go. Um, you've been pretty immersed in the Enneagram world and field for a long time. I know you worked with Russ Hudson um, actually, could you just take us on even just like bullet point, the play by play, like what have you done in the Enneagram world or what were you, what, what were your jobs? <laughs> uh, it's funny cause, and this is sort of like, I forget a lot, uh, what? different things. And it's kind of an interesting, like, uh, might be interesting as a three from, uh, like I was, I was working with some threes recently. And like, we were talking about the difference between the difference of the experience of identity between three and four. Yeah. And how like, you know, like, like the three kind of will have this more like causal cause and effect kind of way of, of experiencing identity. Whereas uh, I think with four, it's, it's like, you know, uh, four, there's a sense that there's an innate authentic self. And that is incongruent with the outer world that's separate from it and that it is apart from it but and, and because of that it doesn't quite feel it feels more like an eternal unchanging self like part of the the structure of four is an over certainty of one's identity but it's like not over certain like mentally it's like an over conviction of what identity feels like what what feels like to be me and how yeah. nothing outwardly mirrors it or relates to it Mm -hmm. And so I'm always like the four struggle or whatever is always over clinging to the felt sense of who and what I am and feeling like I have to be in, in, in a kind of antagonistic or uh, some, of some sort, like a, a negative relationship with the outer world to preserve my inner space. And so identity, therefore, doesn't have as much it's it doesn't it, it sometimes I like forget how my life went in a sequence and it's kind of like a um there's certain th impressions that feel closer to self or less close like it's almost like a like uh like a globe and getting deeper into the core of the globe or further away does that make sense it makes yeah i you're ex saying it beautifully so um is the answer to that question I asked of even available to you? Yeah. So, I mean, if I'm, I'm just going to try to remember what I can remember, but uh, yeah. So like when I was in high school, I learned the Enneagram, got really into it. Um, mm -hmm. I, uh, I, yeah, I, I went to uh, school in Olympia, Washington and um, friends I made there had already been interested in the Gurdjieff stuff independent of the Enneagram personality. Okay. And they were like, you got to read and search the miraculous. You got to get into this stuff. So I did. And I, I got very, you know, very early on interested in Gurdjieff and it tied into a lot of like, I've always been interested in uh, like, like esotericism and the occult and uh, all this kind of weird stuff. And so the Gurdjieff stuff, like hermeticism, you know, uh, synced up pretty well and pretty, you know, it's very hermetic. And so um so from there, I think I kept going to like Enneagram conferences, uh, I International Enneagram Association conferences. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I like I made friends with like uh, Jessica Dibb, who does a lot of breath work. And mm -hmm. uh, I had a breath work session and it was like, holy fuck, uh, I have to study this because it was so impactful. I moved to New York. 
Uh, a lot of friends already live there, and I Jessica studies in Baltimore, but I really dislike Baltimore, so uh, I would bus between New York and Baltimore for years studying breathwork. Uh-huh. Yeah, and uh, eventually, uh, if I'm remembering everything correctly, I was still doing like workshops and stuff for fun and things like that. But um, uh, eventually, like I was already friends with Russ, and Russ needed an assistant uh, after a bunch of shit happened to him and. So I became Russ's assistant and um, was doing my own Enneagram stuff for a while, like at the same time and, and you know, would do coaching and things like this. Uh, we did some retreats together. Like I ended up teaching uh, like his inner work retreats with uh, like one of them, the Thinking Center retreat. And I, I can't remember some other stuff, but all this time I was also like uh, working on an instinct book, my instinct book. And yeah. um and so then, yeah, like I stopped working with Russ during the pandemic because he wasn't traveling. He didn't he didn't need uh, somebody to help him with travels anymore. So uh, mm-hmm. so then, you know, I just published my book and I've been just I see clients uh, for coaching and just Enneagram stuff. And um, yeah, that's that's kind of what I've been up to. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things one of the reasons that I was really excited to interview for this year, well, other than for a lot of reasons, but of of all the people that I've learned the Enneagram from, um, you're one of my favorite. And I've said to people that, you know, when I want to get my ass kicked in terms of Enneagram, like if I want to get schooled in the Enneagram, um, I go to you and, um, you've, thank you've, you <laughs> you're, you're welcome. <laughs> um, thank you. And I think part of what's fascinating to me about you is the way that you almost unselfconsciously without it being a kind of like professional positioning, immerse yourself in this work and field as like a truly authentic expression. And I just wonder if you could speak to that. Like why I've gotten so interested in it. Yeah. So, you know, I'm just, I'm super fascinated by the Enneagram and I've always had a um, kind of intuitive way of, like a psychological way of thinking about people and thinking about interactions with people. And so then learning the Enneagram and like getting my pattern laid very bare uh, you know, is, was was fascinating and shocking. And for me, you know, I very quickly connected it to its origins. And, like, you know, I was like, where'd the fucking thing come from? And, uh, you know, that part of my fascination with Egypt is that I do think it goes all the way back to Egypt. And so this sense of the Enneagram being, being like a, you know, it's like a platonic form that says something about reality like to me like like because i see the enneagram and i see it in people i see it in myself i see the way it's working and it's this you know we represent it as a geometric form and it's like the world of hermeticism the world of these cosmic laws that get represented all these different symbols that i've always been interested in rendered actual through myself, my own consciousness, through other people. And it is this incredible and never ending tool to interpret everything through. And, you know, for for people who are listening or watching or whatever that don't know Gurdjieff, um, you know, he originally taught the Enneagram and it was not a personality system. It was a representation of cosmic laws and it re- combines the law of one, which is represented by the circle, the law of three, represented by the triangle, and the law of seven, which is like the law of process uh, by the point one four two eight five seven one. That's called the hexad. Mm-hmm. And when you put those symbols together, at least from a hermetic Gurdjieffian point of view, what you're doing is you're seeing how the one thing, the, the phenomenon, whatever the phenomenon the Enneagram is describing, and it's three fundamental forces, the active, negative, and reconciling force. 
those are like eternal elements of something. Those are something that is like outside of time or be, you know, the totality of a, t- of a lifespan of something and how those are rendered into um, distinct expressions within time, that one, four, two, eight, five, seven, one, that symbol. And so uh, it's, it's like such a fucking sacred um, to me, you know, like I felt like growing up, like, like I grew up in Atlanta, Georgia, and I sort of felt like uh, everything was like a giant mall, right? Like everything is like this dead, lifeless artifice. And then, you know, and I, and I, like, I'd always been interested in like spirituality, I grew up Catholic and stuff like that. I have been interested in like, in the weird parts of like the Bible, like the Nephilim and all this stuff like this. And then I found this symbol and it was real and it was like this uh portal to escape a kind of crushing uh a, the the sort of the crushing um gloss of how everything's kind of gets gets flattened it was like all of a sudden it, it this this expression of dimensionality and depth that was like everywhere and it was just a matter of slightly altering one's perspective and, and looking with different eyes, not taking things uh, at their surface value. And it decoded so much, you know, I, because I, 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 I'm going kind of self-indulgently here because I know that this is like a four interview. And so I know part of it's like to unpack what a four is about. And so, you know, I did feel extremely out of place and incongruent my whole life and i didn't try to become congruent i didn't i you know it was like i have to be myself but it was this sense that everything uh that i was encountering was um like foreign to me in the sense of like not self material it was all like i like i got stuck in the in the wrong universe and like that like my family and my upbringing everything did not fit everything was like a no like and so Mm -hmm. to find something that contextualized that and also context like that i could bring for example like i remember being like 18 or whatever when i found the enneagram being like hey mom i'm a four and told her what a four was and she was like oh you've been that way your whole life you you never wanted to be here you know like she started bringing up baby pictures of me, like uh, huh. looking like I didn't. I was like regretting being born, which I think is accurate. And so, uh, <laughs> it was like a real. It was like a real relief uh, in a certain way that was like, all right, like there's there's some way that uh, even if I'm the way I am, it like it conforms to some sort of higher order or some kind of. Um, lawfulness or something like it, it, it there's some mm-hmm. way that my offness is actually a part of it rather than i'm just like in the wrong universe does that make sense yeah yeah it makes a lot of sense and one thing that's interesting to me is so this language you're using it was on the on one hand it was a relief to discover the enneagram on the other it was sickening to discover your type and that there was such a precise description of quote unquote who you are can you yeah. talk about that paradox Yeah, I. Um, it doesn't quite strike me as a paradox because on one hand, it's like it is a relief to go. Oh, there's there's something. There's like a intelligence in a sense. You get lo- very loosely like an intelligence or a form or a pattern that that m- renders things in like the universe to make some sense, or that 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 renders people's behaviors and choices and my own choices and behaviors making sense and it helps me see what i'm really after and how i distort that through the lens of my habitual shit um but yeah to see and to suffer how utterly mechanical our personalities are and how little uh you know it renders your sense of personhood very minuscule because uh you start seeing Oh, I've almost made no real choices. Like it's all been choices that are habitual based on preset um, reactions and responses and filters and uh, you know that that there's very little me making a choice. it's it's a structure and it's a pattern. And so there's a, a deeply humiliating 
aspect of the Enneagram, if you're really seeing it right, where, you know, like I'm a, like, like being a three, for example, it's like, I'm sure that like, you know, there's a lot of the, the, the three stuff is like, sometimes you feel pretty good about yourself. And then, and you know, other times you don't, but like, sometimes you like threes can get high on their own supply. And it's like, oh, well, I'm actually just playing a pattern. And for four, it's like, oh, I think I'm either uniquely special or uniquely suffering. And neither is really true. And so it's like the things that even if they were negative in the case of a four or whatever, like the, the pillars of your identity uh, are actually unreliable or even fraudulent pillars. And so, you know, I'm not going to get rid of my fourness. You're not going to get rid of your threeness. But how do you find something in yourself that can use the threeness, that can use the fourness and can use it without getting wholly absorbed in it or wholly rejecting of it? Like, where else do you go to find or locate or collect identity? You know what I'm saying? Yes. And what's that journey been like for you? So, you know, as I said earlier, like uh, being a four, there is a kind of an over certainty, like this is what my identity feels like. And that's not it. 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 And so, you know, um, I was talking to my girlfriend, Alexandra, last night, who's a nine. And the problem with nine is that they sort of don't locate themselves and they kind of see themselves in they can sort of see like, I'm a little bit there and I'm a little bit there, a little bit there. Whereas the four is the opposite where like a, a predominant uh, emotion is disgust and, and it's like a no, it's like, you know. Um, and so for me, it has been a lot of work in, um, you know, working on being in my body mm -hmm. uh, and being confident in my body. So like, you know, identify as a sexual type. And so, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, from being an, in a sexual image type, okay, like I need to feel like I, I felt very disgusting just growing up, like just mm -hmm. unattractive and disgusting. And I was like, I needed to at least feel confident about how my body looks to my like t for myself and, you know, hope like hopefully get a girlfriend. And so, mm -hmm. you know, like using my own types narcissism to be in my body more and to actually you know and that's just what like working out and stuff like that is just one level of it but then it later becomes how do i actually be present in my body how do i actually sense my body how do i actually experience the freedom being in my body and when as a four i'm in the body my identity is less of like a very specific emotional um ping or like a like a a very specific emotional beacon and it relax a little bit and it's like i don't have to be myself. I'm just being myself by being myself. And so it gives me like a it's it's like, like my identity is less than a chokehold, and can relax. And from there, it's like, um, I can't I, like learning to be open is a big, uh, especially with a five wing and all that kind of shit, like learning mm -hmm. to be open to people learning to be open to experiences, learning to uh, realize how much I can handle from being just in my body, like that my emotions and my mind don't have to do all the work. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's for me, uh, you know, like I've mentioned the Gurdjieff work, which is very based in sensation and their movement practices that go along with the Gurdjieff work has been enormously powerful. Breath work has been enormously powerful. And, and when I'm more in my body, it helps me, uh, you know, part of the issue with fours is, is they have a very narrow emotional range, uh, despite how people normally think of fours as hashtag all the feels. It's not all the feels. It's like these feels, this very limited range of feels are me and everything else is no. And so learning to just um, be in the body helps me kind of not have this chronic sense of needing to cling to myself and needing to always be like in a war to be myself against the degrading forces of entropy outside of me right and that helps me actually just like be more kind and be um less reactive and to be willing to experience parts of my identity that have nothing to do with feeling, thinking, or sensing that are like, is there something, uh, a presence that can be 
with all those things, it's not those things. That is something that is more intrinsically me than the pattern that I've normally taken to be myself. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. I mean, so given your expertise and immersion in the, I mean, there's so many questions I could ask in terms of just like having you teach more about the four. Um, and I might actually want to go there a little bit, but I'm really curious to expand a little bit just for anyone listening and wanting to make a distinction about the four or learn more about the four is, um, this narrow range of feelings you're describing. And I'd love for you to say a little more about that and um, have that be distinct from how people normally think about fours and then what your actual inner experience of, of that is like. And then kind of the follow on to that is when you've done inner work, what, what's expanded for you? Um, what's expanded? Like with, yeah, like in particular, like are, are there certain feelings that now you allow yourself to feel that you didn't before or or um, parts or things of yourself that you discovered that are true to you that weren't true before? Yeah. All right, so in terms of narrowness, um, one way I would frame it or set it up is to contrast what four is doing with the other types of the heart center. So, mm -hmm. you know, two, three, and four are all uh, represent different way, universal ways that we know and express our identity. Mm -hmm. And that depending on our type and our trifix and all these things that we overemphasize uh, one of these ways of knowing and expressing our identity. And mm -hmm. so two represents... Uh, the part of our identity that we know and express through relationship and connection, you know, that being in some kind of connection with somebody brings out aspects of self that would not otherwise be actualized. Um, three represents the part of our identity that we know and express through actualizing our potential. Like, you know, threes are really just have such a sensitivity for what's what people's potential is and they're looking and they know they have a lot of potential and they're looking to actualize it and, and express it. And I think that the struggle with three is like early on, they kind of took a template from their family or their, you know, early life experience of what value would look like. And then growing to find out what's my sense of value and how do I actualize that in the world in terms of actually doing something and developing myself and these kind of things. And so in contrast, Four is the part of my identity that I uh, know and express that is just singularly my own. Like, what is mine apart from everything else? What's mine apart from my upbringing? What is like this, you could say kind of like uh, like eternal, just purely me. What is m the kernel of self that is not influenced by anything else? Mm -hmm. And... Um, trying to hone in on that. And so, you know, from the person, from when the, when the personality gets a hold of this project of being myself, uh, apart from anything else, uh, the ego th views it in terms of separating, usually through the affect of frustration and um, rejection and disgust. It says, that's not me, that's not me, that's not me, that's not me. And is, the, the attention goes inward for four of trying to not only locate me, which, which I think a lot of a lot of the four descriptions that are really actually just describing nine mm -hmm. get caught in this kind of introspection without landing on anything. And I think right. that I think that's nine, whereas four is like I've landed on something almost too hard. Yeah, like I'm introspecting right. mm -hmm. and I'm I'm overly focused, but I'm. I'm trying to gr like keep my grip really super fucking tight on my identity. Mm -hmm. And I'm doing that through uh, habitual emotions that I'm in and reactions and aesthetic sensibility. Mm -hmm. What's my personal aesthetic, mm -hmm. um, whether that's expressed through creativity or how I dress or how I approach things like the that like that aesthetic is very, very core to a four sense of what's mine. Yeah. And because yeah. it's about my outlook and it's about about what I'm bringing to my impressions. Like, uh, you know, like I, I paint, for example. And so, you know, painting doesn't come out of a void. It comes out of, oh, I'm receiving impressions through things I'm interested in. And those things have to conform to a certain aesthetic. And then they combine with something in me. And then some like creative, in the case of a painter, paintings come out. But in the case of, you know, a musician, you know, come in differently. So anyway... 
the emotional range and the aesthetic range can be very narrow because in the outer life, there's very little that seems to speak to or that it can extract from outer life that can relate to this thing that inevitably on some level is not going to relate to anything because again, it's trying to be uniquely my own, but it's the ego trying to make this happen. So it's, it's doing that through rejecting and, um, you know, the emotional range is like, you know, fours are sensitive, uh, but that gets overplayed so much in the Enneagram that we forget that like probably the most sensitive type is nine. Right. So a lot of nines think they're fours. Yeah. So a lot of at least like you could, I think comparing who's the most sensitive is, is doesn't make a lot of sense, but the way fours will deal with their sensitivity it can be very different how a nine deals with their sensitivity and the way a four is going to deal with their sensitivity is almost um, filtering everything through this narrow range of frustration mm -hmm. and negativity and not me. And maybe a few things come in that feel like that resonates with me or I can let that in somewhat, but everything else is getting frustrated is filtered through frustration. And so, um, you know, being with Alexandra, my, my nine, um, she's been making some interesting comments on me and my, my sense of being an image type. And she was like, oh, I couldn't understand you as like, like, I know that you're a heart type, but I couldn't understand what a fours image is. And I'm not uh -huh. saying this is the end all. Sorry. No, I'm just, I'm vibing on this point. I'm curious where this is going to go. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> See See, I was like, it's not like the end all be all. This is like what a four's image is about. But at least a lot of the way my image functions is as a rejection of things that's very harsh and very kind of like don't fuck with me and kind of like Alexandra uses the term emotional aggression for four, like which I think is very accurate. There's like a lot of emotional like no and like rid cut things down and attack. But um, it's done as a kind of like don't fuck with me because underneath uh, there's a lot of sensitivity. Mm -hmm. And so this, the, what happens with fours when they become less healthy is that fewer and fewer things seem like they have any relationship to my inner world. And I have to keep giving all my attention to my inner world. And it's like, I whittle away the, the, the ground I have to stand on to feel like myself and to feel like I'm giving attention to myself. Mm -hmm. And so as fours get less healthy, like they get very unable to function in a practical way, unable to focus on anything except for their own reactions and patterns and thoughts they're having about their reactions, which are creating more reactions. And it becomes a very ex extremely narrow sense of self with extremely narrow um, emotional range, mm -hmm. an extremely set, a limited sense of what I can do or who I can be. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, again, to contrast it with nine, because that's the common mistake is that like nines can still go on autopilot, even if they're very depressed, whereas fours have this kind of uh, emotional violence they start inflicting on themselves and other people and a kind of uh, inability to like get outside themselves enough to function. Right. So does that make sense? It does. Yeah. Can you talk too about the image, like the external gaze on the four and how that functions as a heart type? Like we talk about two and the three, like one could be seen in a certain particular way by other people. Yeah. How do you experience that? So, you know, for, for listeners, like you can kind of do it like a, a, a math equation where you put all the triadics together. So four is a, a, a heart type or an image type mm -hmm. that is withdrawn mm -hmm. and reactive mm -hmm. and uh, frustration. And so I have the way that three has a desire to show their sense of, you know, being successful or being valuable. Uh, four has its way. Of, I want to show you that I'm different. I'm all, on a different page. I'm withdrawn. I'm frustrated. I'm showing you my negativity. I'm showing you that I'm not like you. I'm showing you that I'm apart from you. And I might not even be showing you who I am, but I'm definitely showing you we're not on the same page. And, you know, the image is like, we think of images like, oh, how, um, you know, 
like a like a fake thing that you want to uphold and it's not like i don't think that's true for any of the i think it can get that way for the image types but i think it starts out as trying to show you who i am and i think for four it is showing you i'm i'm not like you and it's not a and it's not like a personal thing it's like i'm 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 in a like I'm in my own zone. I'm not in your zone. I'm not in the world zone. I'm just in my own zone. So even if I have a three wing, it's still, it's like, this is my own thing over here that I'm doing, that I'm trying to represent. And um, if you can meet me in my own unique world, I can meet you. So like, you know, as Josh, you and I as friends, like, I don't feel like you're trying to get me to be like you. I don't feel like you're getting, trying to get me to, be any different than I am. I feel like you have a lot of respect for uh, whatever you might be perceiving as my identity or my vibe or whatever. Mm -hmm. And you're just like really accepting of it. And so like, uh, you know, I really, I appreciate that in my friends. Like it's, there's no weird negotiation with trying to get me to be different or express myself differently than I am. Mm -hmm. Whereas I think fours have this natural allergy to uh anybody that's going to try to make an attempt to get them to be on the same page and i think a lot of the identity or the the image for a four is to show you right off the bat i'm not like it's kind of like there's there's a it's not only to show you like like okay here's a little bit of my unique aesthetic or vibe and here is like some of the attitude i'm feeling and that i'm different uh, it's also to get you to say, or to get you to recognize that if you try to fight me to get me to be on the same page as you, you're going to lose. Does that make sense? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it does. Huh. Um, so it's a... kind of, yeah, sorry. Go no, you go. Go ahead. Yeah. So there's, there's, it's, it's, so a lot of times the four aesthetic is not just, oh, they have a very creative aesthetic outlook it's also wrapped in on this like kind of middle finger that's also like i'm very creative but i'm also aloof and i'm not going to give you very much you know what i'm saying yes yeah and so that speaks to the kind of the natural sense of one of the words that i think is is useful that is often associated with fours is a sense of alienation or inner isolation or something like that um mm -hmm. um i just want to check in right now like are you experiencing how are you experiencing yourself or your fourness right now or, or are you um i'm conscious of wanting listeners to like get what a four is right uh-huh yeah <laughs> and distinguish it from what i think is like the common misunderstanding of four that's like ubiquitous out through enneagram understanding yes so I'm really kind of like, I, I keep kind of, I, I catch myself keep referring to, to keep referring back to like, so this is like what's commonly thought to be or understood <laughs> or identified as for, I'm like, but no, it's over here. It's, uh -huh. it's this thing, not that thing. Right. And that's super for bullshit. Um, to be like, no, no, no. And to contrast it with whatever is commonly understood or what, or what I think is commonly understood. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. And I'm also, I mean, there's a five thing in it too. The sort of, sort of just yeah. the frustration with the ignorant masses kind of thing. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, to bring in a, a word that I really like with respect to four, um, and this is actually a word that you've taught me about a lot is the word depth. And so actually our conversation, which we've at this point now spoken somewhat at length about when I was coming up with kind of, you know, how everyone has to have their own names for the types if they're going to be a teacher because the whole copyright thing. I was thinking about naming the type four and I, we had a text conversation and I was like, well, you know, the identity seeker was, and I was naming each type, the seeker of something. It's like the two is a love seeker, three is a value seeker. And I said four potentially identity seeker. And you were like, no, no, because the four, as we've just been describing, is not actually seeking an identity. They're already certain of themselves. And so what the, what they are seeking, though, is depth. And just tying a couple, uh, connecting a couple dots, like this way that you described, it felt like growing up in Atlanta, everything was a shopping mall. It was just sort of this glossy flatness. And what you were yearning for was maybe, and I'm putting words in your mouth, I'd like for you to kind of correct me for or uh, give some texture to this, but depth itself, 
And can you describe what it, how do you know something is deep? What is depth for you? And just give some words around that idea. Yeah. So yeah, I, I, you, you brought up, let's see, I'm trying not to play too much into my own floor pattern, but like, yeah, the, I mean, I'll, I'll just go for it. Cause whatever. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Like, uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Like you're like the thing about identity seeker, it's like, there is like, there's an over certainty of identity, but the identity of four is is intuitively felt to be within depth, which is something that you can't look at. You can't like, like even one's own identity, you can't like say like, like, I mean, the, the, the mistake fours gets into is trying to put their own identity into a box so they can kind of like hold on to it in a very uh, objectifying way. They self objectify and they put uh -huh. themselves into a corner. Mm -hmm. And so when a four is actually you'd say healthy or present and experiencing their identity. Uh, it's not as this grasping for it. It's as an experience that unfolds. And, uh, you know, I was, I just got back from uh, Egypt. Russ Hudson and I did like uh, a three week tour of Egypt from the symbolist Enneagram fourth way perspective. And, uh, you know, there are a lot more pyramids than the three great pyramids. And when you go into like one of these fifth dynasty, small pyramids, uh, you know, you've got this like shaft that you need to go down into the, un to the underground. That's like, um, you know, usually like a meter by meter uh, height and width, and it goes down quite deep sometimes. Mm -hmm. And they recommend that when you go down, that you go backwards. And so as you're going backwards, you're, you're hunched down and what you're seeing is like, you know, you start at the surface where you see outside, you see everybody else you're around with and you go backwards into the darkness, deeper and deeper and deeper. And the light gets further and further away. And I think that's a good metaphor for depth in the sense that you can't look at it and go, this is deep. You can, it's kind of like you just have to back up into it and I think that's true with essence is like, it's something you back up into because you can't objectify it and kind of bring it into the world of the personality into the world of objects. It's something that's mm -hmm. like an experience. And so four makes that mistake where, uh, I feel intuitively that my identity is depth. Like it's, it's, it's of depth itself. Like it is a, rather than a thing, it is a dimension of experience. It's like, you know, when we are present, when we after like when we meditate or right after we do inner work practice, there is a sense that there's a sense of like a kind of a saturation of one's experience, like one's impressions feel saturated, they feel pregnant with meaning, they feel like there's some other thing that they are an expression of, like some deeper thing that you can't quite nail or point to, but it's like it's evocative of a of something mysterious something meaningful something real there's these like qualities that we associate with depth and like you know when we like if we were to like encounter like a work of art or something uh whether it's a film or music or uh a, a painting that that seems to have depth to it it often has a lot of obscurity it has a lot of um, contradiction it has a lot of it, it's like a glimpse of something that you can't normally perceive in a sort of a passive automatic way it's like something that you have to reach for and so I think that there's something about what depth means for four that is in this sense of mystery the sense of reaching uh, this sense of um you know, like something that's beautiful, that's not just pretty, like pretty is a kind of its own thing, but like a beauty that kind of moves your soul is like evocative of some kind of deeper order or deeper something happening on like, there's something else happening here is like the yeah. thing that depth feels like. And so yeah. to tap into that something else is like, feels like really core to what my identity is about in my heart. And so as a four, when you're like having to do taxes and like build a website, it feels like grueling, hellish, 
you know, being taken away from what's really real and important and just absolutely like a, like absolutely artificial. And so, um, so part of what it means to learn to actually be in touch with your identity and your depth is to relax that grasping and relax the rejection that feels like it's a part of that grasping, like rejecting everything to find me. It's like, um, when I can have like a kind of a faith in my inner life and a capacity to be present in body, heart and mind with my sensation, with my feeling, with my perception, mm -hmm. I start to register that there is a presence here that is me that is deeper than the outward phenomenon of my choices and my, you know, uh, like ways that I'm humiliating and, and inadequate and fucked up and stupid and um, lacking. Fours have a certain like sense of like, um, of like wanting to be like it, like an almost like otherworldly being. And when you realize, when you can really just own like that you're a shitting, farting, you know, snotty human, you know, you make dumb jokes and you say dumb things. And it's like, because like all those, those things are not actually you and, and you don't have to take that as a concept. You can start to practice that as an experience through the work of inner work and start to have a sense of what I'm looking for is not going to be actualized through rejecting. It's not going to be actualized through uh, holding on to a certain sense of self. It's like that self is here no matter what. And it's actually the neglect of my inner work that makes that sense of self uh, feel like it's something I have to fight for instead of something I just am and just mm -hmm. trusting in. Yeah, um, I think that starts to really expand a for a sense that they uh exist in the world and can exist in the world and they can be themselves and there's there there's always a separation i think intrinsically but it's a separation that can be held together as a with a, with presence with a third force rather than um as an antagonism between myself and the world does that make sense yeah it does and i want to bring this a little bit to kind of rubber meets the road for example with your book and one of the things so just for people listening so john you wrote you wrote this book it, it's called the instinctual drives in the enneagram. We could I, at some point be interesting to get into the instincts a little bit and what drew you to that as a yeah, is this, topic. Is this video going to be shown to people? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Check it out. That's right, the so book. That's like. You can get on Amazon. Um, it's fucking amazing. It's really, really, really good. Um, Thank you. And what's interesting to me in our last conversation before this call, we we were talking about like how to how to kind of get the book out there more. And there's the sense of like. Um, the things that you would have to do to do that are either not immediately available or they would feel exhausting. Um, and actually even just to, or like we we've talked a little bit in the past about the fours quote unquote resistance to functioning. Um, and uh, maybe even within kind of grounding it in your experience of, of writing and promoting this book, could you talk a little bit about what that experience is like for you? Yeah. So, um, <laughs> So when I, I, I started working for Russ and, you know, we talked about, um, like we, you know, we talked about like our ideas of what we'd like to do in the future and that really none of them ever came to fruition, but, or very few of them, but, um, you know, we were like, yeah, we're, we'll teach together and we'll, we'll write books together and stuff like this. And, uh, you know, I was immediately very interested in, in doing some kind of like, book on like the higher centers, the higher intellectual center, higher emotional center, or like some, like tackling some of like the deeper spirituality. And, uh, and I was like, you know, I thought, Oh, maybe this will be cool. And, um, I had sort of a vague sense of what it was. And then I was like, you know what, uh, you know, maybe that's a project we can do together, but you know what, I'll just like come out real quick with an instinct book because, uh, you know, like I know the instincts really well and it'll be something like, it'll be good to have my own thing. And, uh, you know, shockingly there wasn't like any 
just book straight up dedicated to the instincts. And I thought they were super rich experience thing, you know, thing. And, um, I had a couple of experiences that started cluing me into like how powerful the instincts were. Um, so for one thing, I always thought they were not very well defined and like, I immediately recognized that I was a sexual instinct, uh, but everybody would kept, um, referring to inst sexual instinct in a very social way of like, I like one-on-one -on -one conversations and one-on-one -on -one relating. And I was like, I'm kind of obsessed with sexuality and, and sexual attractiveness. And, um, like if, if there's sexual interest and I was like, I, I need to understand this. And so I had like a, I had like a, um, non-ordinary experience, uh, uh, facilitated by MDMA where, uh, I really had this very clear experience of how afraid I was of not being sexually attractive. Uh -huh. And I thought, holy shit, this is the most superficial shit I could imagine. And this was a core, if not the core fear of mine. What was superficial? And so I launched myself into all kinds of research in biology, which I don't, you know, I was like, know nothing about and uh, evolutionary psychology and anthropology and like just trying to understand like what what in nature would make any sense of what i was experiencing uh as a motivating fear of mine mm -hmm. and as i was doing this you know i'm around people of other instinctual types my my, my parents are self prized types um you know i have a lot of social types in my life and being a four and being annoyed easily, I was like, what's annoying me about these people? And using that as a, also a supplement to kind of, and myself, what's annoying me about myself and other sexual types. Mm -hmm. And so I just did a, a ton of research and it just started to open up. Oh my God. It's like, it's not just that uh, the instincts are not well-defined. They're running the show so much more than I realized running me so much more than I realized I was seeing more and more of just stuff I thought was human was sexual instinct and I being identified with it. And even just the sense of, first of all, what are the instinctual drives? Why do we use them in the context of the Enneagram? And uh, like that was not really addressed anywhere. And so, you know, the reason that we bring in anything like the instincts into the Enneagram is because like our type, we become identified with the instincts. And that identification creates these different patterns of attention, which create different patterns of, of experiencing oneself and, and reactivity. And so that my book eventually, like, you know, my, my premise is basically that the, you know, the core of our self, so to speak, is our, the, our, is our Enneagram types essential quality, you know, like that, that our type is related to essence but that the core of our ego, the core of our, our being identified with our personality is instinct and that we take our sense of self to be based on getting certain outcomes related to our instincts. Mm -hmm. And so uh, writing the book was very difficult, yet it was still uh, enjoyable because I'm learning a lot and I, I, I don't feel like I'm very articulate. Like I'm, I'm a little more articulate here, but like I have my own fucking podcast and I'll listen back and I can't believe I can't form sentences. And okay. so having to write and rewrite and rewrite and, and Josh was like a great help. You had your editing was like really, really vital for me. And um, finding phrases to go to my like into intuitions and impressions was like really a struggle. So editing was a huge thing. Um, but yeah, it was like fun because it was like, it, 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 it was the spiritual book I kind of wanted to write ended up being the instinct book. And, mm -hmm. um, cause the instincts recontextualized everything I knew about the Enneagram. Uh -huh. So that was all kind of fun. Editing sucked, but it was still creative, mm -hmm. but man, trying to like, like I've, I've barely put any effort into promoting it or getting it out there. And Every time I do, uh, it's like I can't imagine anybody giving a shit about the book, or anybody like, or or if if anybody saw like an like I ignore advertisements, and so if anybody saw an advertisement, I would just assume they just ignore it, and I'd be wasting my money. 
or, you know, these kinds of thoughts, or I'm like, oh, probably everybody who's like been interested, in, who'd be interested in this book has probably already heard about it, you know, these kinds of inner talks or whatever. And I also just have this like, um, I've been trying to set like, I got like a Google workstation or something like that. Okay. Uh, set up, and I can't get the email activated. And it's been like months, and I feel like so f- stupid. And I like, like my attention to focus on these like very technical, uh, like things like that are very structured. And then it's like, I mean, in a sense, I guess as I'm saying it out loud, it's like, it's almost things that ask me to be, um, on someone or something else's structure rather than my own structure. Uh huh. Good way to put uh, it. Yeah. It, yeah. It, it starts like, it's like my, my, my inner vision gets blurry. My ability to hold things gets very loose. And it's like, it's like a, a really undeveloped skill. And it's like, uh, yeah. So the advertising thing, part of it too, is like putting myself out there. You know, I, I kind of feel like, yeah, I wrote this book. You should, you should check, check it out. Maybe if you want it, you know, that's, like, <laughs> that's right. like, yeah. I'm, I'm super I, in, interested in the ideas, but I'm also kind of like, uh, I think like, th- like, you know, my experience of like, as a three, I think, you know, like, I've seen you the way that you're like, oh, I can immediately see how someone else would benefit from this. Like, like, you can sort of see like, oh, the value of a thing. Right. And yeah. for me, I'm like, this is very relevant to myself. And maybe it's relevant to you, but maybe it's a waste of time. And like, you know, actually, even though I think the book is really good and I, I believe in it and like I like the idea is like I'm not like enlightened. I'm some fucking piece of shit uh, still and I fuck up all the time and I'm very asleep. And, you know, actually, you know, who knows if it's even valuable for anybody. That's like that's that's what goes on all the time. <laughs> right. Um, something I just also want to point out just as a commentary on what you just said is um, the way that we talk about fours being very comfortable kind of revealing their uh this is probably even too light of a word but their shadow their their shadow side uh-huh. like the fact that you're just um happy like no problem just saying yeah i'm a piece of shit i'm pretty asleep and i'm you know <laughs> like that's um that's not a three talking you know what i'm saying <laughs> um, <laughs> right, right um um anyway but yeah i mean the image actually that came to me as you were talking was the the backing into the pyramid image it's like it's like some it's like that's where you want to be is the it's like i want to keep backing Mm. further and further into this thing and and the process of writing the book was also a process of own of your own kind of self discovery and also discovery of the topic itself so Mm -hmm. we're sort of in that four or five wing kind of uh area and then it's like you you wrote it and then you're kind of just trying to like toss it all the way back up the tunnel so it just lands outside you know that's that's good yeah you know without without like like the the whole process of like fuck i gotta get all the way back out to the world you know where people are um the sun is too bright out there you know that's right yeah (laughs) um it's fascinating to me um I have to, I, I personally, I mean, as a three and also as a person who is your friend and also a person who believes in what you've written and the importance of it, I have a sense of like wanting to actualize it. Like I want people to read this book. I I almost feel like I have more of that sense than you do. <laughs> I feel like you do too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's interesting to me. Um, all right, cool. So, um, We'll probably come to a close soon, but I, um, I want to just explore a couple other things about the four. Um, one thing that's coming to mind is we talk about, um, how do I put this? The, the way that fours are comfortable with other people's, um, shadow material, almost want to hang out with that more than the kind of thing that like their normal patterns or something. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Um, and um, this is something of an Enneagram cliche, but I but I think it's a valuable kind of anchor point is that fours are more comfortable with the human sort of the, sh- the dark side of the human emotional realm than any other type. Um, and um, 
this is potentially blurry territory between nine and four too, but I think a lot of fours become therapists uh, for this reason. They like, they like doing this kind of inner exploration kind of work. Can you just talk about like the experience of, of depth versus superficiality in other people and the, and the, what words you'd put, like, is it willingness to sit with other people's shadow pain or is it like a hunger for it? Is it like a, do you feel more drawn to that than, than other things or what? And I, this is a little bit coming from a social lens too, but I'm curious to, if you mm -hmm. have any um, language for it. So, you know, the word authenticity gets thrown around a lot for four and I think it gets misunderstood uh -huh. a lot. Like people will, you know, okay, I'm doing my four thing, but like making the distinctions, but um <laughs> You know, like you, you could say six is equally as interested, you know, is, is authenticity might even be a bigger buzzword for six because they want to know what's what's true and real. Um, okay. Authenticity is the, the name of the virtue for three. You know, it's like about like mm -hmm. when they're really like streaming from their heart. As a four, uh, you know, I'm always doing that walking into the walking into the pyramid and trying to um, locate and express myself from my inner innermost sense of identity as best I can. You know, there's obviously a compromise. It's like speaking versus text message, right? Like I can only, it's like trying to, you know, trying to, trying to text instead of actually talk. Um, mm -hmm. But because you are as a force so trained in that there is a, there's an awareness uh, of when people are doing that themselves, when they're actually speaking from themselves versus speaking to get you to feel a certain way about them or speaking to um, have some other agenda or to like, you're like, it just, it's very easy to see people's motivations. And even if it's not always clear why they're doing something, it, the, the, the resonance, there's a sensitivity to whether people are uh, resonating or not. Mm -hmm. Um, with with themselves yeah that's and so a, yeah, yeah and so it's not necessarily that like i'm like give me your pain you know but people's pain is usually indicative of where their heart really is mm -hmm. you know like uh you know when i when i teach about the heart center um you know i talk about how like we're not in control of our hearts like the, the we that we think we are is more like a custodian or a guardian or a guide for our hearts. And, you know, the reason that we resist our hearts so much is because our hearts get affected by something and it changes our whole identity. You know, like we fall in love dramatically and, oh shit, now my whole outer life has to conform to this feeling, this no, this, this longing in my heart. And so people put a lot of energy into uh, making their lives and their self-expression come from an ego-driven need to accomplish certain things that help them get their instinctual needs met, whether it's their uh, lifestyle, whether it's getting the right sexual partner, or whether it's right, having the right kind of connections or belonging. You know, it's like, that's the agenda. But when people are revealing what gives them pain uh, and where their pain is, um, there is a way that their heart comes more into the fore. And it's not like the gushy, needy, I want to touch you and be touched by you heart. It's just like a, a, a revelation of who and what I am. And I always really value that. And I'm really moved by that. And it's funny that you're bringing this up because I'm just thinking like I was talking to a client of mine uh, a couple days ago she gave me the feedback that based on my uh, quality of being on the podcast and my my visual aesthetic, she was very uh, intimidated to approach working with me, and but then actually finds me very uh, like soft and easy and gentle and and kind uh, when we're talking about all this stuff. And it's like kind of what we spoke to earlier of that um, image of the four is like this kind of harsh, no 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 thing because I'm trying to put forward like what I what I think at least is deep and real and it you know and every four can and myself included can be 
skewed on what we think we're looking for when it comes to depth. Like I could have the wrong idea of what depth looks like or is, but still that's the aim. And so, uh, yeah, there's when people are just like, are, are just real about their shit. And, uh, like, like, for example, you and I are, are being friends as a three and a four. Like when my sister, my, my younger sister is a three, one of them, my sisters, and we didn't get along at all because I felt like she was always putting forward an image and I was always doing the opposite of trying to undermine the image in some way. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. And, and like, so like what I've appreciated like really quickly about you and, and from a context of having historically not gotten along with some threes is like, you're just very like, this is what I'm about. This is what I'm into. And you're very like, just earnest with what you like and what you're, what you don't like. And you know, you're, you're just like, you're just, you're just being yourself, you know? And, uh, and it like part of the the misconceptions within the Enneagram world is that threes can't be themselves. And it's not true at all. It's just at all. It's people just project their own falsity onto type three, but it's like, you know, it's like a three is just naturally enthusiastic about certain things and they're certain turned on by certain things. And it's like, whatever. And it's like, you're just being really real about who you are. And it's like, all that shit is really great when people have the courage to just show like, you know, we talked about stuff that like, like, um, like you have some music preferences that like sometimes you're a little bit shy about, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like some pop music and stuff that you're like, I yeah. just like this. And I'm like, that's uh-huh. fucking great. You know, <laughs> yeah. uh-huh. like let that's, you're not trying to filter anything. You're just trying to sh- be like, this is who I am. And like, it doesn't mean that every time two people who show each other who they are are going to like each other, but like, I just like you and you, you seem to like me. And it's like just standing in the ground of your own stuff is like that I think is where what really uh, I think for that's like what fours really uh, appreciate. And I think that pain is, is I think, I think I speaking to myself, I feel like I'm in a lot of pain by just existing. And like, even though I'm like a fucking privileged white guy who has an externally very great life, like I can find uh, endless things to suffer about. And I, I do find like when we're all honest that like living itself is very painful. Mm-hmm. And so I think pain and suffering and dark emotions or whatever are just a way that we can all get like, get to what we really are and not what we're trying to be and not what we're hoping for, but just like where we're actually at. Does all that make sense? It does. Yeah. I have one other question for you. This you've, you've ended each of your, um, in my in my experience, very clear explanations of these things with the question, does that make sense? <laughs> What's that about? Uh, I think it's two things. I, I, I think one, I mean, I'm, I am social blind and so I don't have a good reading for what lands with people. Mm-hmm. And uh, like I go into like a little, like when I'm eight, like, I can tell when I'm like listening to my, like I'll sometimes listen to our podcast episodes back and, um, and I can tell when I am, I have a very hard time, like, like being out and sort of like, we just did a, we we just did an episode on the Tinder swindler documentary. Okay. And like, I'm, I'm, I'm being more playful and joking, but I'm not as like in an introspective space. And I can feel how I can barely land sentences and I don't have a sense of like timing with other people and flow. And so uh, when I feel like I'm able to communicate more clearly, it is kind of like something has to open in me and I can kind of like stream like from something inside. And when I was a kid, like nobody fucking understood what I was saying. And they would like, like my parents would ask me if I was schizophrenic and I think in images, so it doesn't always come to like words easily. And so there was a lot of just, I mean, just, you know, that's like kind of default as a four is like, I'm not going to be understood. It's not like, oh, nobody understands me. It's like the default is no one would or could understand you. So I do um, just making sure that what I'm saying when I'm streaming uh, is actually like relevant and communicated is important. Right. I'm also hearing some of the social blind stuff there too. Um, yeah. Like, uh, like 
it's almost like this the sense the sensory experience of knowing you're on the same page as someone is not readily available to you exactly yeah that's fascinating yeah um cool <laughs> well um this is rich as always when i talk to you i'm curious what has this been like for you uh you know i actually like i'm i'm actually pretty touched that you like that like we we did this because um i don't know it's been kind of nice to like uh give words to my experience and i've appreciated your curiosity about my experience and yeah i'm actually getting emotional um mm. Yeah, I'm, I'm very grateful. I'm grateful for our friendship. And I guess it's helped me. Um, you know, there's been a lot of changes in my life with the book and other things. And even just my own understanding of how to apply the Enneagram to my own experience. And so uh, this was like helpful to kind of like take some of that stuff and and kind of go over over myself again in a in a way which is like it feels kind of silly being feels a little self-indulgent uh and i feel a little silly about like the significance of talking about myself but uh it's been actually really really nice for me so i appreciate it josh cool yeah you're welcome um yeah, I just want to share too that I think I just have this. I mean, this is like my actual fucking feeling. I really just I want people to to know you and your work, and um and like who you are, and so and I think that your contributions to the to the enneagram and just the whole fucking thing of inner work and spirituality are very important, um, as I've told you before, and so um. I was actually nervous that you would say no to this because uh because um i don't know what you're up to or uh and you know sometimes you can be kind of like a cat <laughs> you know like i'm not sure when you're <laughs> you know what you're up to <laughs> over there in that world <laughs> of yours <laughs> yeah yeah totally. um um but no i mean i was i mean dude i was just learned so much from you um and um yeah, it's amazing. I mean, it just really, va I mean, we've lived such different lives and it's like finding that wormhole between our in inner universes to like connect and kind of learn from each other has been very, very valuable for me. So, um, yeah, same me too. I really appreciate you. our friendship and I like, I really feel, uh, your like support of me and like the way you've helped me out has been really monumental. And so love you, Josh. Love you too, man. <laughs> All right, man. Well, let's, uh, let's call it there.